Hi, everybody. It's Bob O's. It's Friday. It's the Friday Community Gathering with Theater Resources Unlimited. Um, those of you, oh, this is our 180th consecutive week of doing these. Um, and I'm, I'm actually thrilled to be doing them. I, I, I love doing these so much. I love bringing people together. I love people bringing people into a room together and talking about theater. And we talk about different things every week. Um, and uh, we, I actually would love to have um, you join us at some point out there if you're just discovering us on YouTube or podcast. Uh, I can make that happen. Just email me at trunltd at aol.com, trunltd at aol.com, and we'll invite you every week. Got a bunch of things coming up. And I'm I'm plotting these weekly meetings through, I don't know, through the end of this this millennium, I guess. Um, we um, For those of you who don't know us, True is a, an arts services organization. We're a, we're a not-for-profit, and we basically help people, we support people in understanding the business and navigating the business of theater. Um, and uh, we try to talk about things every week that are of hopefully of interest to the community. Uh, we started off back in 2020 when we were doing this because of COVID. We talked about surviving, uh, surviving in quarantine, basically. We talked about different ways of, of finding new ways of expressing yourselves in art now with Perform live performance not being an option. And we covered a tremendous amount of ground, over 180 of these. And uh, now we're back to kind of what resembles a normal world. Although producers will tell you it's not really quite normal yet. Um, but uh, we're trying to be back up and running and, and have live events and have theater healthy and prospering. Um, we also, Still have COVID around, by the way. I just got my I just got my <laughs> my fifty second vaccine yesterday. I know I guess it was my fifth vaccine yesterday, um, because I'm I'm the guy that's got that's had COVID four times. So everybody just just as a reminder, it's still here. Be conscious. Be be careful. Um, be courteous of people around you. Um, and so here we are talking about theater issues that are not necessarily COVID related anymore. Yay. Um, and I'm lucky to have an old friend of mine, an old, old, basically an office. We, 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 we used to be at something called the, the Playroom Theater, uh, which was run by Eric Krebs. And that's where I first met these two guys. It was a guy named Joey Monda and a guy named Frankie Daly. And they, they had something to do with theater. We're going to talk a little bit, a bit about what that is. Joey, you all met like maybe six months ago. We had him on here. So it's Frankie's turn this time. <clears throat> Frankie, for those of you who have failed to re read the title of, of this podcast today or, or what it's about, Frankie is now um, with a, something called the National Alliance of Musical Theater. And um, we're going to talk about that. But Frankie, whether he likes it or not, is going to be talking about himself as well. I want to find out more about that, Frankie. So I'm going to bring him in here. So yes, you are warned. Yes, it's not just going to be Matt. It's going to be about you. <laughs> right. um, let's let's talk about how we first how we originally met because we were renting um, a monthly space at the Playroom Theater and you had offices there and we couldn't help but run into each other every now and then. Yeah, yeah. So um, I I I guess uh, how I came in contact with Eric would be um where to start. But I uh, you know, I was a, a musical theater student, uh, an actor uh, in college and moved to the city uh, and quickly kind of figured out that that wasn't going to happen. I just kind of got my nose into a little bit too much as an actor. It was problematic, you know, I. Uh, and um and I, I and so yeah I, I I got into the restaurant biz I got pretty far in the restaurant biz I was doing kosher fine dining event sales and I was pretty good at that. Wait, um, you said you did and, say you just did say kosher fine dining events. Yeah, so. if you can believe it, I I I am down on West Broadway. Um, but uh, yeah, and um, I, I at a certain point I kind of uh, made a decision that I I was going to get back into theater and had, could I uh, afford to take some time to work with a community theater in Brooklyn, um, and so was uh, just line producing for them for a while and 
kind of through the nature of uh, getting involved again, I just started to meet writers and was, you know, just, you know, doing odd jobs here and there. Um, and that led to uh, meeting Eric Krebs. Um, and that is, uh, and I, I, you know, eventually kind of became an, his in-house sort of company manager, general manager, producer, you know, kind of right hand for most things. Um, and he owned, um, at the time, one uh, small off-Broadway space, but would eventually get another. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, I jumped right into him with um, uh, an off-Broadway show uh, at New World Stages. Um, and so really just like had a few years to kind of cut my teeth on on kind of all things producing. What was, um, remind me, what's the off-Broadway off off show? My first off-Broadway yeah. show is Greed the Musical by Michael Roberts. Michael Roberts, oh my goodness, uh, old yeah. friend of mine. Uh, Michael has been incredibly good to me uh, over the years, but uh, yeah. So, uh, so that was uh, that's that's kind of how I got started, um, and and where I I met True as as a rental client, um, really, uh, and um, and then started to sit in on some of the meetings at in at night, and and yeah, I got to know a little bit more. Yeah, I've had you as a speaker now and then. I have, I have you and you and yeah. Joe, you and Joey Mondo used to be partners, or you still are partners, and sort of. But you're both at you're both at Nance right now. Yeah. So, well, uh, not, not, I, I, I guess, yes, in yes to all the things. So, um, so well, the I, reason I'm bringing this up is because Joey was a, was a, a, a guest with Sharon Fallon. About, yeah. I don't remember how long ago, but we're talking about general manager stuff. So Joey and I actually met at NAMPT. Um, so I, I, I started working with NAMPT 10 years ago, um, as a line producer for the Festival of New Musicals, um, just kind of as like a little small part-time thing. Um, and Joey was the other line. There are two every year, and Joey was the other one. Um, and so we uh, we met and just really hit things off um, really well. Uh, and um, what, both went back into our lives. You know, he uh, was uh, a part of the producing office for Allegiance at the time, uh, and on Broadway. Um, and I was with Eric. Um, and eventually, the you know the side projects that I was taking on while working for Eric just started to amass to a point where um, I eventually had sort of the ability to kind of jump off on my own. Um, and that looked like um, partnering with Joey. Um, uh, and we we opened a, like a small boutique um, general management office and producing office, um, primarily geared toward uh, new work development and artist led projects. Um, I, and that really and we put it out I uh, put it out into the world for like festival seasons for um, Nymph, uh, which is no longer with us, but the New York Musical Theater Festival, um, and, and a few other things like that. And it really just started to come back tenfold. There was like a real market for that kind of thing. Uh, for the, for the two of us at least, um, and it started to build from there. Um, and for for a while, we uh, we were you know building projects at fifty nine fifty nine and Theater Row um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so that that was that was fun. Um, all the all the while you know developing our work at NAMPT, we were both still line producing there. We would eventually both um, uh, come become the general managers for the festival uh, as well. Uh, right before the pandemic. Um, so and, so in, and, in, yeah. all, in all that, I, I discovered one of the things I really wanted to know, which was, what is it about musical theater that, that led you to become, um, new, uh, give me your title, because I don't have it in front of me right now. I, I am it. the New Works Director new at Works the National Alliance for Musical okay. Theater. Yeah. So, um, so I, and, when, you know, and when did that start? Um, I started full time at NAMPT uh, in May of 2022. Um, so I've been here maybe a little over, about a year and a half. Um, uh, and so, uh, so yeah, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, what was the question? Well, I was just saying that you gave me, you gave me a hint to one of the things I was going to ask, which is how did you, how did you go from general management to, to NAMPT? And the actual, the, the bigger question was how did you go from being a musical theater nerd uh, into general management? And obviously yeah. you have some sort of, you have the head for, for spreadsheets. You can work in, you can work in numbers. So yeah, this is not, this is, not like, this is nothing that not that all artists can do this. It's like it, I it's evolving as I get older my understanding of what it is a little bit. But you know, I think it's like it's all producing at the end of the day. Um it's just different kinds of producing. Um I think that um you know, so I I um in high school I was a musician. I uh, I was a marching band kid big time. Um What did uh, you play? So uh brass. Uh so I started on trumpet and then euphonium and tuba and uh, and just bounced around. I wanted to be a um, a band teacher. I wanted to be a band director um, uh, from like the seventh grade on. I knew I wanted to go to James Madison University because I wanted to be in their marching band, part of the marching Royal Dukes. Like I, I knew that. 
Um, and then I got to There's school. So much, about, so much about you I don't know. <laughs> I got this is to great. school this is... uh, and I sort of quickly figured out that I, I, I didn't want to do that anymore. Um, I, I had a sort of interpersonal disagreement with my studio professor at the time and, and I just... Uh, and those kind of things are those are marriages, you know, like you're you're going to school to kind of do one thing with one person for a long time and you better get along. Um, and we didn't. Uh, and so I, I was back to the drawing board a bit. And um, just recently, um, as I started college, um, I had started doing theater. Um, my my high school didn't really have a theater program, um, but I had done competitive speech and debate and um, uh, forensics. Um, and so I had a little bit of a like dramatic interp background. Um, and then I, I had been doing community theater productions. I, uh, my senior year of high school, I did uh, 34th Street, a Miracle on 34th Street. I was Mr. Shellhammer. Um, I followed that up with Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, um, and I, then stage manager show, you know, I just crazy stuff. Um, but, uh, and so that, I, that like basically blended its way by the end of my freshman year of college, I had transferred in uh, to the musical theater program at JMU as, a, as an acting major. Um, and so, well, so that was that like creative impulse has kind of always been there. Um, it's just kind of wrapped in, um, you know, program management and project management. So now um, that you're at, at NAMT, how much of your general management and producing background do you use and how much of your knowledge of musical theater do you use? Yeah, I think like part of this that we're also skipping over is that, um, you know, well, Joey and I were getting our office started um, off Broadway. Um, uh, we became the in-house GMs for the Musical Theater Factory, which is a small um, new musical development organization. We've had them um, on here, yes. Yeah, and they uh, they had just um, they had just launched. They were maybe like two years into the kind of the lifeline of their company, and um, really starting to get on their feet um, and and figure out a sustainable pathway forward. Um, and had just started the residency with Playwrights Horizons, and and it was a really exciting time for the company. And so um, it was there, honestly, that we um, we had so such a playground to start building programs to develop musicals. You know, this this uh, residency that we had with Playwrights Horizons gave us um, a ton of space. Um, and when you're doing this, um, you know, for a living, space is huge um, uh, because this is a live act. You know, we could, over the pandemic, I think we discovered how to use kind of this forum a little bit better. But, you know, pre-2019, um, it was a different story. Um, and so, um, so yeah, um, we had we had two and a half years really with Musical Theater Factory where we were just like devising different kinds of residency styles and, and approaches towards stage readings and, and you know, musical theater open mic nights. And uh, we had a series at Joe's Pub. And so we were really like playing with format and structure of how um, new musicals are being created. Um, and so and so from there, um, I, I actually stepped into uh, the GM role at uh, Nymph for a brief period of time um, uh, before moving kind of back into my private uh, uh, general management office as well. Uh, and so I've, I've kind of gotten a little bit like a, a, a touch point on all of these organizations that are doing this good work. My, my thesis at the end of college was on Nymph uh, and, and the development of new musicals, particularly in New York City. Um, and so uh, this the kind of how the sausage gets made has always been um been there for me um and this is i think my role at, at NAMT now is um kind of getting to see that on both sides a little bit because like we we do provide you know this wonderful um development opportunity in the festival but th the festival is one program that we offer we also have a triplicate of granting programs for the development and production of new musicals um, we have another granting program that's just for capacity building in initiatives that a lot of other funding programs don't even fund. Um, we uh, we have two conferences every year where we discuss not just you know development pathways for musicals, but the marketing around them and the fundraising around them as well. Um, and then I, on, on top of that, we are also the new stewards for um, uh, the uh, initiative for the National Endowment for the Arts uh, called the Musical Theater uh, Songwriting Challenge for High School Students, um, which is the American American Theater Wing has been uh, hosting for the past four or five years, and we're we're newly taking that on this year. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna that. go back to some of that and go into more detail about it. But I just I just want to say that this is an a, an an incredible uh, example of somebody who found uh, a, a place to, to to do your job where you are able to use everything that you absolutely love. So it sounds like you love musical theater, and it sounds like you don't mind navigating business. And true happens to be about 
the combination of art and art and business. So uh, this is a great com conversation for me to be sharing with everybody. Um, so how much of your business hat do you wear and how much of your art artistic hat do you wear in your new position? Yeah, I don't try to pretend to be anything that I'm not. Um, so I, I think that I'm, you know, I, first of all, I, I want to frame, you know, the, the festival and a lot of the, the work that we're doing um, has uh, a huge amount of support from our members, um, which uh, uh, our membership is made of, uh, you know, the leaders of organizations and their staffs um, uh, from producing and presenting theaters, regional theaters, commercial producers, independent producers, and otherwise that are all coming together in furtherance of musical theater really as an art form at the end of the day. Um, and so um, I have the the um, benefit of being able to kind of comfortably surround myself with all of those um, professionals and supplement my skill set where I know that I have deficits. Um, and so, and that falls on both sides, you know, um, that's uh, that's the producing and the the dramaturgical, um, the aspects of this job um, that that are uh, you know both wildly required, I think, to get to the end of the day. Um, I, I I would say, um, you know, in in uh, the way that the festival works, particularly, that's not particularly a development program for me. Um, I think that development happens um, by nature of you know at the end of the day, we're doing stage readings in front of an industry audience, and we're cutting it down to 45 minute presentations and you know development occurs in that just by nature of doing it um the goal is not to reach like huge developmental arcs over the process though it's really a pr moment this is a, this is like introducing your show to the industry and i think that is where kind of my brain starts you know clicking a little faster and like putting the pieces together so that's kind of personally where i try to lean into things um, I'm, so and then the drum I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned said that because i i have to tell you i was in <laughs> I'm, I'm so old. I was in the second season of NAMPT, a show of mine. And um, that was back when we did the whole show. Now you just do 45 minutes, right? Yeah, now we just do 45 minutes. And so 45 minute stage reading, no set, no costumes, no lighting cues. Um, we are starting to get a little adventurous with um, with sound only by nature of um, the way things are being composed now. You know, there, there are fewer things that are being composed on a keyboard and there are a lot of things that are being composed on on a MacBook, uh, and so uh, that guilty I, is charged, Your Honor. Yeah, and so <laughs> it just changes also the way that we have to present it too. Um, and so, so that that's um, sort of evolving the way that we talk about audio, which maybe we'll talk about a little later. Too, well, I want to go yeah. back to the conversation of de development versus versus a marketing opportunity because um, uh, for uh, people need to understand that um, that NAMPT is for those of you who don't know, NAMPT is an opportunity for you to have your show done in front of uh, like 80 different regional theater artistic directors who come in just for this for this festival or people that are involved in producing on, on one level or, or another of, of new musicals. So it's a, it's a spectacular opportunity. My mistake when I when I did the Naptos, I thought it was a developmental opportunity. And so I was I was like trying to do my whole show because I wanted to see if, if things were working. It's not what it's for. And I, I, I wish I I wish I'd known that a long time ago. I won't say how many years ago, but a long time ago. Um, so I want people to, to understand that um, there, in terms of development, well, let's start with let's start with the process. Pe people submit in what way to to NAMPT? How do they submit their musicals? Yeah, so um, our uh, submission cycle is actually open right now. Um, you can head over to namptorg slash fest app. I'll drop that in the in the chat in a bit. Um, but I. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, and it's just a, it's a submission through Submittable, um, which is a pretty popular platform that that's used um, in the, in the biz. Um, but uh, uh, there's a few components of that. There's a lot of information on our website. I will admit it is a beast of an application. Um, it's a big one. Um, it's also an anonymous application, uh, and so we uh, we do a fair amount of work to make sure that there's no identifying information in anything that you provide um, that would lead us to knowing that it's you. Um, and I, to qualify that, I know it's you, um, but I don't make any decisions. Um, so there's a festival committee uh, that will ultimately evaluates this over the course of the evaluation process, and I'm sure we'll get more into that. But um, but I I don't make any decisions. Um, I just facilitate the process for the festival committee. And to go back to the development versus marketing opportunity, uh, the re the reason why I think it's good to stress this isn't a development opportunity is because well, first of all, you are presenting forty five minutes. You are um, basically you're there to have your show be seen. So it's not 
necessarily the best place for early early stage early development of, of a show. I mean, there's you have to have a certain level of of um, accomplishment um, in order to to present effectively, uh, because the people that are coming to see your show are not well there's no black and white about this but they're not necessarily going to say oh let's take this and that, that into our workshop and let's 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 work on this this show most of them are looking for something that might fill a slot that actually might fill a slot right now um so uh am, am i correct in saying that uh, yeah i would again? Yeah, I would agree. I'd say, you know, like even the eligibility for, for the festival specifically. And I just want to qualify, we're saying NAMPT, but we really are meaning the festival, which is a program at NAMPT. Um, but uh, um, the eligibility for that is that the show has to be completed, um, or at least uh, knowing that this is an evolving art form and things are never completed, but uh, it has to be in a complete form. Uh, and that uh, also you have to have more than half of your uh, uh, your score demoed out, um, available in demo tracks um, that you can upload as well. Um, and that's really just in an effort for it to be competitive um, as a part of the evaluation process. The, too. the Richard Rogers says 45 minutes of recorded music. How, do you have a do you have a time limit, a time requirement or just half, we don't just have half we don't have a cap on it. Um, so we do have um, in terms of like the the rounds, like in the first round of evaluation, there's a limit to how much of the material is actually uh, consumed by the evaluators. Um, but I uh, but uh, you you can upload there's the way that the application works, you can upload 20 individual tracks, the first 20 individual tracks. And then from there, you can uh, upload a, a zip file of the entire demo out you know demo track of everything you've got and then the second and third round that entire uh demo is listened to is there any opportunity for somebody who only has maybe half their score demo not the whole score or yeah how about, can... how about if they have the entire score um in pdfs not not necessarily recorded uh, you, we do need demo material. We do need audio material. Newly this year, um, we have an alternative media section, um, the internal alternative media upload. Uh, and this is really in an effort for there to be um, sort of a technological capability for um, the form to be able to accept it, um, you know, file types of you know, different sizes or whatever, you know, things that sometimes are holding us back just because of the capable capability of the application itself. Um, uh, we imagine that that section could also also kind of be open for um, different, uh, you know, variations of uh, writers with, uh, you know, different relationships to access, you know, um, you know, what does it look like for a deaf writer that might need to upload, you know, a demo track that they've maybe never heard, you know, is there another material that maybe we would consider in that instance? And so we just, we want to have that ability to kind of leave that option open um, as the, the notion of, you know, new musicals is evolving every day. Uh, but yeah. Well, the thing I'm, I'm concerned about, in my career over the years, I've known many people who have demoed six to eight songs in the show before they actually have the, the ability financially to demo the entire thing. So that's, are those people are being passed by now or no? No, no, no. You can, um, I mean, like you can do sort of like a, a rough demo. Like we have everything from scratch demos of people recording themselves on their phone playing on the piano to, you know, full, like, you know, fully produced things that are mixed in logic and, you know, people in a studio. We, we get things on both ends of the spectrum. And then we also do, as a part of our evaluation process with our committees, a fair amount of coaching um, on uh, how to uh, assess production bias when you're in a selection process too. So that, uh, that, it, that includes being able to take demos that sound wildly different on a production level and be able to evaluate them fairly against each other as well. Running a musicals reading series for the past 20 years, and getting submissions and tons of submissions and demos, uh, I can tell you that that a lot of a lot of readers are really impressed by very well produced demos, in spite of the fact that they say they know, they can tell they can tell they, you know, a really really well produced demo does sometimes hide a lot of flaws. For, yeah, for some, I would for some say, readers, I would say what we also um try to do on the evaluation side of that too, though um in the um, so so maybe I should talk more about what the evaluation process is, but um we try to sort of get a get questions and and um, responses away from things that can draw upon like a more finished product, and lean more into the passion and uh and kind of uh, uh relevance of the work as well. Um, well, I know Karen so. Dewey has had her hand up. I think yeah. she's finally. I think she finally put her question in the in the in the chat. Are demos okay without vocals recorded? 
just the, the music recorded. They are, but I think you just have to be a realist about like what the what the environment is going to be competitively. I uh, you know so um so we we can use our imagination. We can we can read along as long as maybe there's like a melody line on the piano that we can we can hear with it. Um, that would be acceptable, but I I don't know that it's your best foot forward in in sort of a national scale competitive program like this. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's probably in your best interest to have someone singing that material just so there's nothing lost in translation either. Um, we've got really well equipped. These are leaders in the fields that are that are evaluating these and they know how this works and they know they've got a head start in how to do this. Um, but I, but again, like anything that you can provide them to give them, you know, a leg up in just consuming your material is only to your advantage. Karen, was, does that answer your questions or did you have anything else you wanted to ask? All right. I, do. I guess Thanks, we'll, I, I guess we'll move on. Thank you, Karen. Um, so um, so maybe I could talk a, like a little more broadly about the evaluation process, the selection sure. process. So, um, so uh, selection uh, uh, submissions are open now. Um, we uh, accept free submissions uh, through December nineteenth this year, uh, and then from there uh, we'll uh, accept late submissions with a small fee until January 9th. Um, there won't be an extension date, uh, and the reason being because last year uh, we had five hundred and seventy five submissions for the festival, um, which was by far our most submitted year every year uh, ever. Um, prior to that, we had had four hundred and eighty submissions, um, and the year prior to that, uh, we'd only 230 um but that year we also still required the um the member endorsement um which might be a thing you might know about uh, if you've known about us for a while we used to require a member endorsement for in order for you to submit we no longer require that so anyone is free to submit whether or not you have a member endorsement um, at all you know that um, so leads, again, leads off off to, off that topic a little bit but about you um <clears throat> what have you brought to your to your position uh, do you have are you responsible for some of those changes or um, I uh, some of the uh, material changes to the application this year in terms of um, in terms of access uh, I, I would say that I I've brought to the table but I, I I can't take you know sole responsibility for quite anything because it's a full committee you know at the end of the day that's directing this and so uh, so it's really uh, it's I'm I'm their hand. <laughs> when you <laughs> excuse me, I'm got something stuck in my throat. When you when you came into the into your new position. Were there things that you were hoping would might be different, and are you, do, are there still things that you would like to see be different? What is oh, what gosh, is it you personally want to sure. bring? What yeah, is it you um, personally would like to see? I mean, I I think like the thing that I am thinking about um, the most, being in this position and kind of in the crux of all of these regional theaters around the world, is financial sustainability for this program and for all of these programs, um, and how and and also the vertical integration of this too. Now, so so we're adding somebody you know, say, songwriting challenge to this. Did somebody say him? Feed into, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, uh, we're by no means anywhere near anything precarious, but I uh, but you know we we want uh, we're we're not exempt from any of the um, the difficulties that the um, the rest of the industry are facing financially. Um, all, albeit we're a membership organization and an art services organization, we still, you know, uh, are a producing company. At the end of the day, we we do a huge event every year. We do, uh, you know, an event in a spring conference in a different city, you know, in the spring every year. And so it, there, there's a, a quite a bit going on that we're, you know, we 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 experience the same amount of risk. Um, and so I I think a lot about um as we're coming back from the pandemic, how to take advantage of um, everyone I, I just being so ready to go again, you know, and and to, and get kind of the right people uh, back into this process um, in terms of sponsors, in terms of uh, just like general partners. And then I and activated across the membership too to start producing these shows. Um, I, and as, you know, theaters are lighting up across the country and around the world again you know we want we want them to be NAMM shows so your financial model i think you just touched on this a little bit but your financial mo model basically there people don't pay writers don't pay to be part of NIMP. i mean with this is an application fee but it's not it's, it's just nominal um so the you're supported by by sponsors and probably um funders you have funders that 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 support you as well, like the we have a, NEA. 
Um, yeah, we have we have uh, you know institutional funders for sure, and and you know, granting organizations that support us. Uh, it's a large contingent of sponsorships, uh, 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 and um, and yeah, uh, and and you know a very small group of of independent donors that we're also trying to build out. But so is everyone else uh, after the pandemic too. Right. Um, and so uh, so so again, yeah, it, we're you know we're a five hundred one c three organization, just like just like many of our members, and and we you know play the same game in terms of fundraising. I think maybe it's a little. And Bob, you probably understand this too, just being a member organization that you uh, have to sort of respect. Um, you know, the fundraising habits of your members too, and, and you know, draw clear boundaries around kind of where everybody's dipping into the pool. And so that, that I think that's an additional challenge for us sometimes is that we want to make sure that we're not, you know, um, getting in the way of the fundraising efforts of any of our members while also creating our own sustainability pathway forward um, for our organization. Uh, that's I, that's so tricky. Yeah. Now that you mentioned it, that's very tricky. I hadn't even thought of it. <laughs> but yeah, um, so... <clears throat> John Ewing wants to know if you were all accepting sponsors. I would guess yes. I would uh, guess yeah, emphat are, emphatic um, emphatically yes. We are starting to talk about sponsors for our spring conference, um, which will happen in April uh, and is going to be hosted at the Lyric Theater of Oklahoma City uh, this year. Uh, and so we are starting, uh, we will soon probably be opening up the sponsor, the sponsor search for that. Uh, and then a little later into the summer, we'll, uh, we'll open up for fall sponsors. And that, that's a, always an exciting time uh, and lot, lots to do there. Oh, I see another question from Karen. Karen, uh, this this um, the festival takes place in New York, and it, it takes place in uh, two usually two theaters in, in New World stages. But who knows what will be next year? Who knows? But um, and so yes, everybody comes in. All of the regional theaters send their representatives or their artistic directors. In many cases, in to, uh, to it's an it's an event. It's an annual event that people just go look forward to and go to and love. Um, we all I mean, we love going to NAMP. Uh, named we all do um so you can be from anywhere you don't have to be in new york but you probably will need to come into new york if your show is being done um although i guess it's not an absolute is it frankie say that one more time you if you're out, if you as a writer are outside of new york it would just be inconceivable of, uh, to me that you wouldn't come in to be to be part of this and be part of the process. We I mean, it's sure not... hope you would, but I I also wouldn't make any assumptions. You know, that it is it's pretty expensive to to travel, and it is a you know it's a two to three week process that we're going to ask you to be in New York for as well. Um, and I will say that the, the one of the few things that we cannot provide for is travel and housing as a part of this process, uh, and so uh, we do pay everyone that's involved a small fee. Um, uh, but we're not able to subsidize uh, travel and housing costs for for anyone, um, uh, writers, directors, actors, otherwise. Uh, uh, and so, so yeah, um, we do hope that um, you know folks are able to kind of carve uh, out uh, how this fits into their life. And and in terms of what we were just talking about, where we I'd love to see you know this organization kind of do more in the future. That's absolutely one of the places too. But I think that falls into the same conversation of you know our sustainable path forward um, financially too. I think Michael asked this before you before you answered it because I think you answered this. Why do you think there were so many this year? Five hundred and seventy-five. Wow. I think it's because there's so much that's been in the pipeline. So much has been put on hold because of COVID. So there was yeah. there's no there's no submission in in twenty twenty. What, what I, I no, we had say. a submission every year. We had a festival every year. Um, we we ended up having two digital years. Um, or kind of we had one fully digital and one um hybrid. A year where we had uh, still film presentations, but we did have a live event kind of screening them. Um, but uh, but yeah, I honestly I think that um, I think that it's just so easy to write a musical as somebody, no matter where you are now, um, simply through this. Uh, and I a ton of people did, uh, and I and they started in 2020, and by the time 2022 rolled around, I guess they were ready to start submitting them. Uh, and 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 we're right for that. It's a little daunting, 575 <laughs> submissions. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, M Michelle wants to know, can you describe the resources that are provided by NAMP? So, okay. So let, let me emphasize from my understanding of it, the writer is not really expected to pay for things when they're part of NAMP, are they? I mean, isn't it usually sponsored? 
Yeah, so we um we end up so uh, the festival uh, is you know a coming together of all of our members plus hundreds and hundreds of other producers uh, for two days at New World Stages uh, in October. Um, we present forty five minute cuts of these new musicals of eight shows that we've selected from this process. Um, uh, it's an inter international uh, search for these shows, uh, and uh, it's about a seventh month seven month uh, selection process all in. Um, so it takes this this entire thing takes a full year. We actually open submissions for the following year on the first day of the festival. Uh, and so, uh, so yeah, we present 45 minute um, uh, staged readings of those. Um, those are actors at music stands um, with microphones. Um, uh, there's a small band. Uh, it's usually a music director plus two additional players. Um, so, so a small, uh, you know, guitar, bass, and sometimes drums, uh, so on and so forth. Um, uh, we uh, we supply fees for all of um, the core creative team. So that's a director, a music director, um, uh, the cast. Uh, we have a festival casting director. Michael Casera uh, is our festival casting My director. My God, he's been forever. Yeah, you are have, so um, you are so faithful to Michael. Good for you. We have uh, a, a festival sound designer and um, a core audio team um, for each theater as well. Uh, and then we'll have a line producer uh, suited for uh, each stage. Um, um, each stage will have four of the shows housed on it. Um, and then each show also has a, a stage manager um, that's brought onto the teams too. So, so yeah, we have sort of a, a general management and producing staff kind of at the top of the pyramid, pyramid. And then we've got these uh, eight shows that are all spread over uh, Pearl Studios, who is one of our sponsors, who we are so grateful for. Thank you, Pearl Studios. Uh, and um, uh, and Art New York, uh, and uh, and we we take over those spaces for two weeks. Um, we have uh, up to twenty hours of uh, studio rehearsal time. Um, so we we work on um, uh, something similar to the twenty nine hour stage reading agreement. Uh, our stage reading uh, guidelines. Um, uh, we only use 20 hours um, in studio, and then we have a 90-minute sound check on the stage uh, uh, that that will ultimately host the presentation at the top of the week, uh, and then we have the two presentations. So we like to say it's a 20-plus hour process, since that 20 hours of rehearsal studio time plus sound check plus the presentations. Um, comes out to be about 25 hours all in. So again, 45 minutes in 25 hours, um, you know, when we're used to doing kind of a two and a half hour musical in 29, um, if you kind of contextualize it that way, it's a little bit of a luxury, but it's still lightning quick and, um, and yeah. Oh, so, uh, so let's see, uh, Joel Bailey wants to know if a musical is going through. I, I want to actually get to your other programs, but we'll we'll we'll, we'll stay with this, this for now. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, if a musical is going through significant rewrites and revisions, can the show? Oh, well, actually, the question is, can a show be resubmitted? If a if show can be submitted uh, three times, uh, it will age out in its uh, in its fourth year. On um, uh, if a show undergoes any sort of development with a member organization, that member may write into NAMP stating, we have developed this show significantly recently uh, and would authorize them to be able to submit another time. And then most slash all cases will usually grant that um, for an additional submission year. And a lot of the information that you've just been giving us, by the way, uh, talks to the question that you mentioned earlier, which is uh, the sustainability of the of the festival itself. Um, the, it costs it costs a tremendous amount of money because you're, pay, you're paying for everything. Um, right. So people have to understand that. But you're also paying paying for everything with sponsorships and with grants, grant monies, and with what you know whatever other su support people are offering you. But uh, ultimately, your budget is your budget. You have to you have to make sure you have enough money to cover the costs of eight shows being pre presented, which is probably one of the reasons why it used to be twelve back in when I was in it. <laughs> it was twelve back then. It, it's down to down to eight. It's been eight for a long time now, hasn't it? Uh, for all ten years that I've done it, it's been eight. Well, I go back farther than that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let's see. So. Uh, let me look. Uh, Ross, voice of God, Ross. Uh, are there any questions that I've been missing? Any conversations about what we're talking about now? Because I want to go to other programs as well. There, there is more than just the festival. 
With the submission um, submission period open, I just wanted to touch on and kind of talk through a little bit more of what that selection process was like, uh, oh, if okay. I could quickly. So, um, so we did have 575 submissions last year. So um, it's a three-stage selection process or evaluation process. Um, that first uh, stage, all 575 shows are evaluated. Um, as a part of your submission, you'll upload um, a 20-page excerpt. Um, and that can be any continuous 20 pages that you choose. We usually suggest it's the first 20. Um, and kind of the dramaturgical background behind that is it's usually an action-packed storytelling segment. That first 20 pages uh, it gives us a sense of the show. Sometimes that's not the strongest and only you're going to know that. Um, but uh, you include those 20, uh, th those 20 pages and that is what is reviewed as a part of round one. Uh, and so last year um, with 575 submissions, we had a 77 uh, person uh, round one screening committee, uh, which again is made up largely of members, uh, alumni directors, uh, directing observers, dramaturgs um, uh, that are all coming together as part of this group um, to evaluate these shows. Um, each one of those 20 page segments, um, those, those submissions are, are evaluated four or five times. Um, and then uh, they're scored uh, and, and the, the evaluations are, are uh, primarily scored on uh, merits of achievement. So, so that's lyrics and book and, uh, and the, the music, um, but then also certain like passion points. Uh, so what your, what your personal passion to see it produced is uh, and, and uh, other kind of key, key moments there too. Um, from there, uh, the NAMP staff will then, and a reminder that it's all anonymous too. So, uh, so no one uh, any, at any point should be familiar with, really with any of the work that they're um, evaluating. Um, and we, we monitor that pretty closely. Um, uh, from there, uh, NAMP staff will uh, do some accounting um, for where we are score-wise, uh, and we will uh, curate a round two group to move forward. Um, from uh, our 575 last year, we moved to 95 to round two. Um, we don't really set kind of a, 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 a kind of a metric of what we want to hit there. We kind of play it by ear. We see sort of where the nat natural cliff off in scoring is, and, and we, we move from there. Um, round two is where we move to uh, the festival committee. Uh, and so the festival committee uh, is uh, it's on our website. Um, it's one of our, one of our uh, committees for for NAMP. Um, but uh, these are true leaders in the field, um, uh, uh, leaders of the arc form uh, at regional theaters and commercial producers. Uh, otherwise, um, Sharon Fallon is actually uh, one of the co-chairs of our festival committee this year. Um, but uh, so they uh, they take uh, uh, the second round. Um, I like to call it the campaigning round. So of those 95 shows, that group of 20 uh, uh, festival committee members will divide those up amongst themselves. Uh, so not everyone is quite reading everything, um, but everything gets read um, about four or five times. Uh, and then uh, they'll come together for a meeting at the end of that month and they'll campaign. Um, so of what you read, you're trying to convince then the rest of the group that that show should make it into the top 20. Uh, you want to convince the rest of the folks that didn't read your show that they should. Uh, and so some of the shows you're going to feel a little more like going to bat for and some of them you won't. Uh, and that's kind of how that that whole thing works. It's a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, big feelings. We really want big feelings, especially if you didn't like it, um, uh, because someone's surely going to disagree with you. Um, and so uh, from there, um, we select uh, a top 20. Uh, I, and then the festival committee uh, will evaluate the entirety of all of those shows. So all 20 festival committee members will read all 20 finalist shows. Um, we also have a screener conversation. NAMP staff uh, has a screener conversation with those 20 finalists as well. And we go through kind of the elements of the program and just make sure that they're game um, to accept it if they do make it into the eight. Um, and so after uh, that round three reading process, um, we will bring then our festival committee members who are at their theaters across all corners of the world to New York City um, to be in the same room. Uh, and we select eight um, from there. And that's how, that's how they get picked. Well, let me ask you this in terms of content, in terms of style, <clears throat> are there any um, guidelines that you can give anybody in terms of the things that you think are of most interest? either just in the Gestalt right now or at NAMT right now. Uh, and have you noticed over the years um, whether there's any discrepancy between how many shows are by young people and how many shows are by older writers? Hmm. You know, I I don't know that I can give you any like significantly 
like data, like hard data. So that one is not hard. Yeah, it's all anecdotal. anecdotal like, <clears throat> yeah, um, I, I. I would say that, you know, NAMT is a phenomenal, NAMT, uh, the festival is a phenomenal opportunity in its own right, but really what we're doing is just leading to the opportunities that are available at all of our members. Um, it's a dating service, like you were saying, um, we are just trying to provide a pathway to get to, you know, the, the readings and workshops and productions that are available at the theaters that are present at, at the festival across the country and around the world. Um, and so to that end, um, it's those people that are in the room making the decision about the Festival 8. And we intentionally stack that deck so that they're going to disagree uh, and have conflicting interests. So, you know, we've got commercial producers next to really crunchy, artsy, fartsy producers next to, you know, presenting organizations that have 10,000 seat theaters next to, you know, off off Broadway theaters that are mostly developing work and you sometimes do something in a 30 seat theater, you know? So uh, we try well, to mean, get like a real mixed bag. Uh, in, in inevitably, to... inevitably, because I mean, I go through this with our reading series as well. And I just, there's nothing I think we can do about it. Inevitably, uh, readers will be attracted to things for personal reasons. And and there there's always going to be some of that going on. Um, and I guess what you're doing is you, you try to create as fair a process as possible by making sure that it's not everybody with the same aesthetic reading the same pieces. So uh, hopefully the the disparity of, of aesthetics and personal taste um, comes up with something that's as close to fair as we can ever be. I mean, yeah. I go through the, I go through the same thing with our, with our play reading series. I would say also that, you know, so many of our, our festival committee members are, you know, they're so boots on the ground and working with um, artists that um, I think, you know, have never had opportunity, um, uh, like, uh, is now before them before. And the, it's an interest, I think, to, you know, fully develop the pipeline with programs like the festival um, on a broader national scale to be um, to be accessible for, for artists of all kinds. Um, uh, and we're, we're seeing a lot of, of that uh, uh, come through uh, in, in the data. You know, we're getting more and more people of color submitting shows. We're getting more and more uh, you know, uh, gender expansive and trans artists and, uh, and, and otherwise that are submitting shows. Uh, and so we're, we're, you know, we have a real vested interest to make sure that those stories have a place that they can get told. Um, and we're, you know, I think the start of that, um, that race and the, the beginning of that pathway uh, in some ways. And so hopefully we're just reinforcing something um, nationally and otherwise. Well, basically, I, I think that, that we're swinging towards another direction right now, which a lot of the classic um, people that write in classic style um, are not, may not be taken as seriously as people that are writing in non-traditional forms. Um, I see a lot of openness to non-traditional forms, and sometimes it means that people who write what is a, you know, they'll say is oh, it's a it's a classic Broadway musical. Um, it may not be viewed in the same way. Um, it's the world we're in, and we we do what we we're doing what we can, and we're doing what we can to make sure that as many voices are heard. Uh, I have yeah. this. I have the problem. This problem in my in my reading series also in terms of getting en enough diversity in my readers so that I don't have uh, all the plays picked by white male fifty year olds who are the ones that love to read. Um, I tried. I tried to get. We have. You have to get diversity into your readership so that people who are reading it have a an understanding of the new forms that are being submitted. Sure. I think I'm just trying to follow kind of where um, people are starting to find us and like different pathways through social media. But also, I think like we're starting to get so many cross um, uh, medium artists uh, that uh, you know, people that are coming specifically from the music world or people that are coming from opera um, or or film. Um, and, you know, especially having gone through two years where we were a digital festival in, in a lot of ways. Um, the just the way that some musicals are it, it, the way that like stage directions operate now you know like you, you, you it might say like you see a twitch in his eye and like on what stage do you see that like I you know that's not a stage direction necessarily like <laughs> that's, that's something that's a that? film that's 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 something that we're being directed to see in film and 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 but people are writing that way and I think we have to uh, uh, lean into that a little bit and like and let it happen and see where it goes um, and so, so I'm excited to kind of um, bend this program around kind of the will of the writers a little bit, um, especially as much as the festival committee uh, is interested in producing that work, uh, and it seems that they are. 
Well, the the other thing that's sort of in in uh, inescapable is that there's always going to be a, a battle between the next big hit, the next big commercial show, and the next significantly unique voice. Um, they may not always be the same thing, and so we we all we're all struggling to to balance that. People ask me what we're looking for when we when we they submit to our series, and we're looking for a lot of different things. We're, I mean, we really are. We're just, we're looking for the next big commercial hit so that we can get our name on the map, but we're also looking for non-traditional shows that really surprise you. And uh, we're also looking for shows that deal with significant current social issues. Um, yeah, I think all of that. And then you, you, also you do like, your best. You just do your best to figure it out. Yeah, we're. I mean, like, what does it mean to be a commercial hit anymore either too? Like in a world where, you know, you're, this, these musicals can go on to, to anything they can be video games they can be you know there, there's so many different pathways for for where things can go and and it, it, it might not even be the show for some of them it might be it might be them it might be one member of the team that that gets interest out of the festival but we just we try to be open to just about anything that we can do and, and bendy um in this kind of new culture of musical theater that really if you open your eyes it's it's in everything um uh we just have to kind of steal back from all the other industries that have taken from us a little bit too. Oh, that, that's a, that's an inter interesting conversation there too. Um, let me uh, uh, let me go to some of the other things. Okay, let's. We've talked about the festival. Um, if you haven't asked a question about the festival, you can you can still put something in the chat, and we can still deal with it. But um, you were talking about the other things that that NAMP does. One of the things that, that I've always appreciated was that you that you keep. You keep all the writers that come through you. You keep them in a community, and you, you keep in touch with us. I mean, I still I'm I was in your I was in your your festival around the turn of the the tw the nineteenth century, <laughs> so, and, uh, and I still get emails. And I like the fact that you do roundtables and you do conversations and conferences and things like that. So talk a little bit about that, how that plays into the development of a, of a community of musical theater lovers. Yeah, um, I we've got a few ways that we try to um, keep folks kind of engaged with each other. Um, I, I I really think that we're you know we're building a an alumni community of festival writers, and then we've got the membership. I think on the other side of that, and as much as we can kind of bring those or those organizations those kind of communities together um, to to facilitate conversation and 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 collaboration, you know that's the goal. Um, at the end of the day. Um, uh, like, Sorry, I'm seeing this question real quick. Should we uh, screenplay format that makes a screen and stage? Would that be acceptable for the festival? Maybe, um, maybe we could uh, have a chat and we can take a look uh, at it together. Um, I'm happy to maybe have a one on one with you. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm sorry, the, the, the 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 real the real life answer to that, Karen, is that basically you have a a commit you have a series of of people that are readers who have certain expectations and. A lot of a lot of times when we have people that are reading plays for us, we get a whisper to us in our ear, this is really a screenplay. Um, it, it's not a question whether it's a screenplay format, but it's a question of whether your your work actually would work on, on a stage. The reason why screenplays are different, a lot, there's a lot of reasons. One of the things is screenplays uh, really focus on the visuals and um, theater work really focuses on, focus on the words. Um, and the music, it, and we we can't we can't show the the eye the twitch in the eye, um, but you can put the twitch in the eye into a screenplay. It doesn't make any it doesn't make any difference if you put it into a into a stage plays stage directions. But maybe um, it's a little crunchy to say that. Like I kind of am interested more as folks are doing that more. Like what what does that happen to the future of you know of how we're writing to start changing these conventions and merging them together a little bit. Um, I don't I don't mind that so much. Well, the, and the other thing is, uh, it, again, there's no there's no black and white, there's no right or wrong, uh, Karen. It's basically it's a question of what is most comfortable on stage. So, like a play, a, a show that uh, that you write that has 50, 50 characters or more, may not be comfortable for a producer. That may not be something that they can really embrace and say, well, we can do this unless they're Hal Prince in the show is Showboat. Um, but and also the number of locations. Unless you think of your thing, you have to think in stage terms. I think that's it's what it really boils down to. Um, screenplays, you, you think about your show differently in the screenplay than you would as, uh, if it's really destined for producibility on a stage. 
there's just things that you can do and things that are, I won't say that you can't do, but things that are much more difficult to do. So that I'm, I'm, I'm talking for you a lot. I'm, I'm sorry. You, you're, you're the one that should be telling, should be saying no, whether, no, I'm, whether, I'm full, whether I'm full of it or whether, whether you, you think. No, I, I think that's fine. I mean, like, I think that like, uh, you know, I think mediums are all starting to merge a little bit and it'll be cool to see what comes of it. I would say, you know, particularly for you, Karen, you know, it might depend on if they're in your musical, is there, is there film aspects, you know, like it is, it, would it be appropriate in some instances that it would make more sense to have kind of conventions for screenplay writing in it, you know, that it might. Uh, and so maybe we should take a look at it together and make sure. Again, I will, you know, defer what I said earlier, though, this is a competitive process and you want to make things clear, concise, and easy to consume for the evaluators as possible. Just do yourself a favor. Yeah, well, each reader is probably reading dozens of scripts yeah so yeah you have, in, you're, in, you're, you're, in, you're in, in an environment you talked about environment before it's a it's considered the consider the environment that you're that you're submitting to so Absolutely. um other things that you guys do uh let's talk about the grants uh, yeah. a, li a little bit more de detail yeah, so we have, um, so I administer the Frank Young Fund for New Musicals, um, which is a triplicate of granting programs uh, that exist for the development and production of new of new work. Uh, and so uh, that uh, the three stages of that really are the writer's residency grants, uh, the project development grants, and our production grants. Um, so our writer's residency grants, um, we have a cycle for that open right now. Um, these are all members or, or um, grants that are available to our not-for-profit members. Um, our 501c3 members in the United States. Um, uh, and so the, the member organization will apply for the grant itself. Um, so they will source sort of the project that they're interested in, the writers that they're interested in working with, uh, and then they will develop the application uh, and put that forward. Um, uh, so the, the writer's residency grant cycle is open now. Um, a little bit later, uh, we'll, uh, in, a little bit later this month actually, we'll open up LOIs for um, the, our project development and production grants. Um, project development grants are um, for uh, up to $5,000 grants um, uh, for readings and workshops and you know sub sub production kind of developmental activities there. Uh, and then of course, production grants um, up to $10,000 per production. Um, for a full production of new work. Um, and then uh, we also have the ability for members to co-produce those events and kind of ante up on the grant gift that they can apply for as well. So if two members go in for a co-production, they can actually both get that 10,000 cap to a 20,000. Um, and so on and so forth. So, um, so yeah, that's uh, kind of part of the pipeline that we the, we develop into this too is uh, not only producing um, and presenting um, these writers uh, to our members, but then also trying to provide our members with the resources to be able to kind of continue the job um, and and uh, keep things going. That's actually really terrific. Um, uh, I missed a, a question. Susan Crawford asked. Does it matter if the show has been produced? If so, does it need to be a world premiere? Well, I mean, if it's uh, so the, does, it, does, does the show need to be a world premiere? I think is is one of the, it's does it does it matter if the show has been produced or does it need to be a world premiere? So I think there uh, there are two things. There there cannot have been um, a high profile production of it. So nothing you know Broadway or West End um, or or anything that um, sort of would kind of take it out of the developmental sphere at this point. Um, and it also cannot be licensed because um, at that, that point there's sort of a, a you know script of record. It's not developed anymore. You're not not developing anymore. Um, uh, but uh, if if you're pre both of those things, if you're pre Broadway and you're pre licensing, then uh, you're more than likely eligible. Um, there's a few other eligibility uh, requirements, and you can check those out on the website. Uh, but they're small ones. Okay. Um, have I missed any programs? Um, do we, is there another grant pro program, or is it is just the three part? There's one more granting program, uh, the Impact and Exploration Fund uh, at NAMPS. Um, I am not uh, associated with that one. That's uh, Adam Grossworth, our membership, our member services director, uh, facilitates that. But that is geared toward um, capacity building initiatives for our members um, uh, with regard to new musical projects, but not necessarily um, geared toward production or development work. Um, and so sometimes that looks like, um, you know, listening devices or a ramp or uh, a, a wide variety of um, and I, you know, I access invite I, I presentations and performances and 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 all sorts of um, interesting uh, and meaningful work that um, often doesn't have another funding opportunity for it um, out there. Um, any other questions from the room, guys? 
I mean, we covered a lot. You describe um, the different constituencies of your membership. Regional theaters, yeah, so it's a large number of regional theaters um, I, I, and um, uh, regional theaters, uh, New York uh, theaters, uh, developing organizations, development organizations, uh, and then um, independent producers as well, um, uh, and academic organizations, uh, academic institutions too. A lot of university musical theater programs are also our members. Now let's go back to a basic here. Uh, if you have 575 shows, um, submitted uh what other are there any opportunities other than the eight shows that are selected i mean i think that you do a song workers a song songwriters workshop and and other things yeah so what are some of the things that if, if they don't if they're not one of the chosen eight what what are other possibilities of being yeah supported? so we do program uh, a few other supplemental programs on um, as a part of the festival we uh this past year we had um and, and for many years we've had the songwriter showcase uh, and that highlights three um, musical theater projects, usually shows. Um, this year we did an, an album uh, as well, um, but uh, by uh, teams in different stages of development intentionally. And then we also have like a Q&A component uh, as a part of that to get to meet the teams and see some presentations, some performances from the work. Um, and then we also have the midday cabaret series, um, which happens during lunch uh, on both days of the festival. And that uh, uh, is in exploration of a, a songwriter's sort of small body of work um, over a 20 minute cabaret set um, in the green room lounge at New World Stages. Um, I think Kimberly's, the answer to Kimberly's is yes. She, she, I have a staged reading. Of, uh, 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 NAMP doesn't, doesn't disqualify you for staged readings of, of any sort. I mean, that's no. just not even, it's the, the question that we ask people when, when people submit is what will, what will a, a staged reading, because essentially you're doing staged readings at, at NAMPT as well, how will that help the development if you've already had a production, how will it help the development if, to go back a, a step into a staged reading with us? So um, I think that you, you hinted at something like that as well. It's basically what what is the value of doing a stage reading well the value obviously is to be seen by regional theaters yeah, but if you I had a, if like... you had a full if you had a full production then then the, it becomes questionable because well i mean like if you've had a full production though i mean like we blanket statement though like this is sort of a late development activity you know for your for your show like if you're if you're in the festival like you're you're really ready for serious development on your work or you're getting toward workshop and production stage at this point and so um or you're ready to work on something new too um which it, which happens a lot um, to festival writers too that come in and get commission opportunities and and you know the uh, some of our members want to be the first theater to do their next thing, um, which is super exciting too. But um, but yeah, a stage reading would be fine. Um, and if you've had a production already and you're coming back to do a stage reading, I would say you know the benefit of NAMP at that point is that you know we we, we have. <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of producers that can come uh, see your show uh, and um, and it's not necessarily a developmental step you know remember we're not like, we're not trying to achieve massive development of your work we're trying to package it and sell it uh, to the right uh, to the right buyer well um, unless I see more hands go up uh, we can we can end today uh, oh the hand went up Michael Michael Salat Mike Salat Mike's a lot. Mike's a lot. I was feverishly typing another uh, no, uh, question, but maybe I'll just ask it. I just said, what's the best way to start researching early stage developmental organ organizations specifically for mission values, you know, and a potential fit? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Maybe we could connect um, offline as well. Oh, um, I would love that. I, I would, I mean, like right away, you know, doing my job, I'd point you to our membership list on our website and, and right. you know, start taking Gander through there. But um, I'm sure maybe through, you know, Rise, Maestro also has a lot of uh, interesting connections to organizations out there too. You know, there's ways that you can kind of, um, if you're looking for, you know, a specific community to reach with your show, um, there's ways that we can kind of find the pathway to it. Oh, that would be amazing. Um, I sent you an invitation on LinkedIn. Is that the best way or do you want me to send you an email? I'm going to drop my uh, email in the chat right now so that everyone's okay. on it. For everybody to see. Yeah. It's, Thank on you. Our web so... it's on our website too. So not no gatekeeping here. Uh, <laughs> but there we go. What should I put on my subject line so you know it's me? Anything you want. I'll remember, yeah. True, okay. com true community gathering. So he knows it was it was from Friday. Okay, got it. 
Okay. Find out. We'll um, find out. Uh, we'll find out more. Anybody else want to come into the room and ask a question before I before I wrap up? Uh, and after we wrap up, we can also stay here and, and uh, sort of communicate with each other and network. Um, Michael, just so you know, there was a lot of background noise on your on you. I just muted you, so um, I'm going to stop your video. Uh, you're going to ask have to ask me to put put it back up again. Um, so I'm going to go to speaker view again and say thank you everybody for being with us, Frankie. <laughs> it was great seeing you. It's just yeah. great seeing you. I I don't know why I I I had no idea that you were that you had such a strong background in musical theater. I mean, I just, I met you as a general manager and I thought of you as a general manager and producer. Um, and then you're you're at Nant, I'm going, hmm, how did that happen? Yeah, yes. and, and it makes perfect sense now. I mean, you you definitely know musical theater and it, you definitely are in a place that you, that you want to be because it sounds like you have a tremendous desire to support the development of new works and to develop uh, new writers. Uh, so yeah. thank you for that. Yeah, it's an organization that's been phenomenal to me for my entire career, and I'm so happy to you know be a part of this new moment in this industry, um, and to and to you know take it further. So thank you very much, and thank you for you know just being a like-minded organization that's doing you know a fair amount of the good work too. Thank you, I appreciate that. We do we do the best. We all do the best we can, right? Um, so uh, everybody out there in podcast land and YouTube land. Um, we'd love to have you in the room. We'd love to have you be able to ask questions as well and be part of the conversation. So uh, do email me at trunltd at aol.com, trunltd at aol.com. And I will be happy to send you the link every week and invite you into the room. And we have all sorts of th interesting things coming up. Next week, we're going to have an overview of, of what's going on in the London producing scene. And we're actually specifically going to talk about why it seems like it's a lot easier to develop new works in the UK than it is in the US. Um, so we have uh, some producers there who have a lot to say about that. And I think you'll find it interesting. The week after for Thanksgiving, I'm actually going to have a, a conversation about theater with the true board. I'm bringing in members of my board and we're gonna, you're gonna meet them. They're gonna tell you about why they're on the true board and why they do what they do and what they do. And we'll have conversations about what's going on um, one thing that's going on that I should ju just note that we're very happy about is that the sag after strike is now over. Um, the nightmare that's, <laughs> that's going to linger on is is not passed yet, but but at least the strike is over. So we're very happy, and it's, again, it's it's one more step into the future, into a future that looks a little brighter than than it's looked before. Um, so uh, we do this. <laughs> we do this as a this has been like a community service since. April 17th, 2020. And um, I I can't ever tell people that they can't come for free. I mean, you can always come here for free. However, we do have something called pay what you pay what you can. So if you can pay something, um, we have bills to pay and it, it just keeps us running. So go to true donate, tru donate.com, tru donate.com. Um, that's a short URL for what our real URL is for that, for the donation page. But if, if you can give us something, that'd be great. And if you can't, still keep coming back and being part of the community. Being part of the community is valuable and it's contributing. Um, so we appreciate you very much. Um, see you soon, I hope. Maybe next week even. Thank you. <laughs>